Well, let's start with the everlasting God because that's exactly who he is. And strength rises in our souls when we wait upon the Lord. And to wait means to look to God, to trust in him. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliver. Oh yeah, you are the ever. Do not faint, you won't grow weary. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. before you and give you joy and honor lord a savior who's come died for us rose for us lives for us and will come for us so lord we pray that you would open our eyes to see the wonder of god the wonder of your mercy the greatness of your love and the power of your forgiveness lord so we look to you lord take your word and touch our hearts lord thank you that you're in this place lord it's one thing for all of us to be here, but for you to be here, oh God. Because you gave a promise if we would come in your name. 
And Lord, when we say we come in your name, we're not coming just casually or flippantly. We're coming because we want to be with Jesus. And we know you want to be with us. So praise your name, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that you're mighty to save. That, Lord, you can reach and lift up the fallen and the broken and the ruined. You can come to us in all of our heartaches and sorrows. You come to us, Lord, with the load and the burden of sin, and you save. And you deliver, Lord. And we have the evidence, Lord, in so many lives. And while it's true there are lots of hypocrites out there who are churchy but not Christians, that doesn't change the truth of who you are and what you've done in so many lives so sweetly. So here we are. In our weakness, we look to you, and we believe you're mighty to save. And we look to you for that in our lives and the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's not too loud out there, is it? Mark's not my sound man today, so I don't know what's going on out there. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Oh, forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, oh fill my life again, I give my life to follow everything I believe in, now I serve. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Oh, forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light out. Let the whole world see, singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see, singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move. He is mighty to save, oh, forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, oh, Savior, he can move the mountain, my God is mighty to save. Mighty to save, hope forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see, singing for 
the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, oh forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
mighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. I will adore you. God is so good. We've been going through Isaiah 53 in the Bible, and uh, this was, of course, written 600 years before Jesus ever came, predicts his death to a T, um, predicts his even burial and his resurrection. So we've spent quite a bit of time looking at the death of Christ and the effect of that. Today we're going to be looking at the resurrection of Jesus and all that comes from that, too. And one of the things that comes from it is that he is glorified. All glory be to Christ. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain it's built. Tomorrow's day, tell me what is your life? It's a mist that vanishes at dawn. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ, our King. All glory. Christ, 
our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. <coughs> I think Leonard has a song for us this morning, so he's going to come and sing. I'm going to do a song called Impossible Mile. Jesus was his name, and love was his game, and every word he spoke was the truth. Guess who paid the price when they nailed him to the cross? And he paid the price for me and for you. Yes, he walked. Yes, he walked up the hill to Calvary. God was giving up his only child and it's there yes it's there in the book for us to read how we walk that impossible mind oh the thunder some nuts. Oh, it tastes like, it looks like it tastes good. It tastes really good. Mm -hmm. Don't eat too fast, you know. Oh, no, you don't have to worry about me. I'm a pig. <coughs> <coughs> oh, 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 what's wrong? 
You can't breathe? Oh, let me help you. I think I know what to do. I think I know what to do. I think jump on your head. Oh, grab you from behind. Oh, 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 Are you okay? I'm okay now. I got a nut got crossways in there. You were right, I was eating too fast. Being a little bit of a pig, I guess. Well, that's what you are, but still, you have to be careful when you're eating. I know. Oh, Lammy, you saved my life. If I had been doing this on my own, I don't think I would have got that nut out of there. Well, I'm glad I could help, but I didn't know what to do at first. I thought I had to jump on your head. Oh, I'm glad you didn't do that. No, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I know somebody said there's some kind of a maneuver. A maneuver? Yeah, it's a Henry maneuver. <laughs> oh, you mean John Henry maneuver? No, no, not John Henry, a Henry. Oh, that's not that word. I forget what it is, but I'm supposed to hug you from the back and squeeze you. Well, I think, I think I'm going to have some sore ribs from it anyway, but I'm so glad I'm still alive. Hey, you know, that reminds me of something. What does it remind you of? Well, it's like I almost died and come back to life. Yeah, but you didn't. No, I know, but it was like that. But I know somebody who did die and come back to life. Oh, um, was it somebody that got the Henry Lamech remover? No, it wasn't somebody that got squeezed like that. It was somebody who died for us. Oh, I know who that is. It's Jesus. Yep, he died on the cross. Yeah, that's true. Too bad, eh? Well, it is bad, but it's good, too. How can it be good? I mean, he died on a cross. That's pretty bad. Yes, but he rose from the dead, and that's pretty good. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's true. It's kind of like you're still here. That's pretty good. Yep, even though he almost choked to death. But, uh, yeah, but Jesus died and rose from the dead, and now he can save anybody who comes to him. Really? Anybody? Yep, doesn't matter what they've done, doesn't matter how bad they've been, they can ask God for forgiveness, and he'll give it to them. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's like you saved my life, but Jesus is the Savior for the whole world. Oh, wow. Hey, you see Millie around? Uh, yeah, he's over at, she's over at the barn. The cow, uh, he's getting her hoofs trimmed. Oh, the farmer's trimming Millie's hoofs. Yep. Well, I better go down there and see what's going on. Maybe I could get my hoofs trimmed too. Well, maybe so. Maybe I'll go along with you. But I'm not getting my hoofs trimmed. I like to be digging in the mud. Oh, yeah, you're a pig, right? I'm a pig, that's for sure. I'm a pink pig named Percy. Yeah, that's true. Well, I'm glad you're still alive. Yeah, well, so am I. And I'm glad we have a Savior, too, Jesus. Savior for the world. Wow, that's awesome. I'm glad I could help you. I'm glad you did, too. All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord, who once was slain, reconciled man to God. Forever you will be. The Lamb upon the throne, upon the throne, I gladly bow the knee, I gladly bow the knee, worship you alone.
passages in this chapter in the Old Testament, remembering that it was written long before Jesus came, and, and it wasn't like uh, something that they constructed later on, because the Dead Sea Scrolls actually show us that the book of Isaiah we have today, the same book that was written at the time of Isaiah, which was 600 years before Christ. They were buried in the caves, they, they were sitting in those caves for over 2,000 years. People have said, oh, well, we don't know if the Bible's accurate. We don't know if it was, you know, preserved all these years. It got changed. People rewrote it. They did whatever they wanted with it. But God had a witness for, for our generation so that a shepherd boy fires a rock in a cave along the shore of the Dead Sea and hears something pottery breaking and goes down and finds all these scrolls. They recently, just recently, found some more scrolls. I just heard that some other books of the Old Testament. But the complete book of Isaiah was there, and this was written before Jesus came, and it describes his death and his crucifixion and his resurrection, which is amazing. It's not amazing if you believe in God, but it certainly is amazing if you don't. You don't have a leg to stand on from an historical viewpoint or uh, in terms of accuracy. So I'm going to take up where I left off and I want to talk today about the resurrection and see that the resurrection is found in the book of Isaiah 53 along with the crucifixion of Christ. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. This was the purpose of his dying. This is what we've looked at in the last three sermons was his death for us that we were the ones that went astray, we are the ones that have sinned, we are the ones that decided we don't need God, we're the ones who have done our own thing, gone our own way, but we've reaped the results of it. We have a broken world around us, we have broken hearts, broken homes, and broken lives all around us, friends, and all of us have been contributed to the brokenness, and we're partakers of that brokenness. And no one is excused from that, all of us have. As soon as we get old enough to, to uh, say no, things start going in the wrong direction. And, uh, but Jesus came, and he was oppressed, he was afflicted, 
but he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He came, he was willingly to come, he willed himself to come and be oppressed, to be afflicted, and he didn't challenge it. He went all the way to the cross. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, just like a sheep before his shearers is silent. He didn't open his mouth. He could have called on a legion of angels. When the soldiers came to arrest him, he said to them, don't you know even now I could call on my father and he would send a legion of angels? But did he? No. No. Why? Because this is what he came to do. He came to die in your place. He came to take your sin on his shoulders. He came to take the punishment you deserve on himself. And so he could not fight back. He could have, but he would not. Let's say he would not fight back because he loves you and he loves me. He saw that the only way that you or I could be ever rescued from an eternal hell was for him to take that hell on himself. And so this is what he came and did. He took that hell on himself when he suffered on the cross. He was taken from prison and from judgment. They, they, they arrested him and then they judged him falsely. And who will declare his generation? I hope that you do. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the sin, for the transgressions, for us crossing the line, for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. That's what he was stricken for. For those who would trust in him, he takes their punishment. He was stricken so you don't have to be stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. We saw that, yes, he died with two thieves, one on either side. We saw that even though he should have been thrown away, cast and eaten by the dogs, as often happened to those who were crucified uh, outside of Jerusalem, those who were wicked, uh, not so with Jesus. God honored his son in his death. And God made sure that he was buried in a rich man's grave because he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. These all things exa happened exactly that way when the time came. We come to Isaiah 53, 10 and begin with our text for today. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise his son. And that's a hard thing to imagine. How could it please a father to bruise his own son, to take their, his own child and have him bruised? He put him to grief. Understand this. While it is true that it was wicked men that took him and crucified him, it was in the father's plan and it was in the father's will because he was making his son's soul an offering for sin. Because the redemption of the human race hung in the balance. Because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So God sent his son to be crucified on your behalf. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Not that he was happy that his son was being bruised, but he was happy with the results of what took place. He was happy to see that salvation was opened, that the way was open for anyone who wants to come. Now the reality is, friends, that while the door is open for anyone, it will only be uh, go through. The only ones that will go through are the ones who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Heaven is not for everyone because not everyone wants heaven. Some people want their sin and you will not get into heaven with your sins. If you think of all the sins you've ever committed and if every one of them were held against you right now, every wrong thought, word, and deed. That's quite a list, isn't it? Any one of us would say, don't show that movie, I don't want to see it. And I don't want anybody else to see it either. But you're going to see it. Unless you accept Christ as your savior on the day of judgment, the books will be opened, it says, and the deeds that you have done will all be written, it'll all be marked. What a movie! But my friend, if you trust Christ, what Jesus did on the cross is come to wipe it all out. All of it. Every fault against you, against God that you have committed towards God and towards others will be forgiven. All manner of sin will be forgiven, said Jesus. All manner. Only one 
that won't be forgiven, and that's a sin against the Holy Spirit. And the sin against the Holy Spirit is the rejection of the Spirit's ministry, which is to draw you to Jesus. Does that make sense? If you don't trust Christ, then you've rejected the ministry of the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God is at work calling each one of us to repentance, to turn from our sin and put our trust in Christ so that on the day of judgment, we go free because Jesus' soul was offered for our sins because he took the punishment. You deserve to be punished for your sins. Now, you'll reap the consequences of your sin. Everybody does. You know what I mean? If I, you know, guzzle a, 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 a 40 of booze every day, before long, I'm going to reap some consequences, am I? My liver's going to start screaming. And then it's going to start whimpering. And then it's going to bust. It's gone. We'll reap the consequences of our sin, but the consequences of our sin is not the judgment for our sins. It's just the consequences. And so the judgment is what we need to settle with God. So God looks at our world, He looks at our lostness, and He's just, He has to punish your sins. If He didn't punish your sins, He would be unjust. But because of His justice, He has to punish your sins or God would no longer be just. And He knows the damage of sin. He knows that one sin leads to another, to another, to another, that the whole world is seething and boiling with the wickedness of sin in our world. He sees it all, and he says, I've got one solution, but the solution is not to come down and mandate everybody down here, now you're not going to sin anymore. No, the solution was to send his son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world and to bear the punishment for your sins, and in the depth of his mercy and love, to offer it to the human race and say, here, here's the answer for your sin. Individually, each one of us can respond to the Lord, and if you do, you will have eternal life. And if you don't, you won't. It's not complicated. You know, a lot of people think, oh, that relig religion is so complicated. We can't, nobody can figure it. Nobody knows. We know because God has told us. We know because Jesus Christ has come. We know because he has validated these truths in his word and he's validated them in the lives and the hearts of those who put their trust in him. He made his soul an offering for sin. And what's the result of that? It says this. He will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. I'm going to explain that in a second. He will see the labor of his soul, and he'll be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors and bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. So I'm going to come back now to Isaiah 53, 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief when you made his soul an offering for sin. He will see his seed. He will see his seed. What does that mean? It means his offspring. I think I mentioned this last week as well, but his offspring, who's the offspring of Jesus? We are. You become the offspring of Jesus when you put your faith in God. When you trust Him as your Savior, He adopts you. He causes you to have a new birth. We heard the term born again, right? I mean, well, a lot of people don't even understand what that means. They think it's a, a particular religion. Oh, that's the born agains. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the, you know, the Presbyterians and the Catholics and the... No. Anyone, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your background is, Anyone can be born again if they put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what it is. A new birth means a new life. In 1978, I was going in one direction, far away from God, filled with anger at the, even the thought of God, filled with drugs and alcohol and booze and violence and wickedness, and yet when I met Jesus Christ, my life completely turned around and I went in another direction. I was born again. I had a new life. I wasn't the same person anymore. He will see his seed. He will see his offspring. Jesus will. He has many children. Many children. Look what it says in John 1.11. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. This was a sad thing because he came to the Jews with the gospel. He, he was born a Jew. And he brought the gospel to the Jews and they rejected it. They said, no, we don't want you. We'll, we'll put you to death. We'll crucify you. Not all. But the ruling leaders did. They did not receive him 
But look what it says in John 1, 12. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. The right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And they were born, it wasn't by blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. It's a spiritual birth. You got it? We're not born of, oh, my, my father was a, you know, a Scotsman, and I am a Scotsman. That must count for something. Right, Alan? Oh, yes. Yeah. That's not what it's about. It's not whether your father was a Christian, or your mother was a Christian, or your grandmother was a Christian. Thank God if they were, they would be praying for you. But that's not how you become a Christian. You don't get a Christ, become a Christian because you were born and you went to a certain church. No church can make you a Christian. I can't make you a Christian. And I could baptize you 65 times every which way. I could do, do it upside down. I can do it right side up, sideways. And you still won't become a Christian unless you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior first. The new birth is a spiritual birth that happens in the soul. Baptism is only the outward sign of what happens inwardly when you trust Christ. If you receive him as your savior, then go ahead and be water baptized. If you haven't received him as your savior, it's a futile exercise. We're not born of blood. It's not the will of the flesh. It's not going to get born by your willpower. Well, I'm determined and I'm going to be the best Christian in the world. You won't be. You can't be. You need Jesus to be a Christian. You need a new life. You need a new heart. You need a new transformation in your soul. That's what makes you a child of God. See, Jesus looked at the labor of his soul, and he was satisfied with this. He's, it, it tells us, as we saw, he said that he will see his seed. He'll see his offspring. These are the offspring of God, the ones who were born not of blood, filled with the flesh, nor of the will of man. That means it's not by anybody else's will either. Nobody can force you to become a believer in Jesus Christ. Nobody can make you a Christian. You have to come to Jesus and trust him. You know, that makes him a father because that's what fathers do, or mothers. In this case, a father. They have children. In 2 Corinthians 6, 18, it says, I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Jesus is bringing children into the world, and he delights in it. Surely, at least most fathers or mothers in their right mind are happy when a child is born, aren't they? They rejoice over it. Years ago, you know, in the old days, way back in ancient times, the father sat in the waiting room, waiting with a cigar in his hand of all things i can never understood that one there you know let's poison ourselves because the baby's born but i mean they didn't know better in those days and then the mother's in there screaming and the father's out there shaking at least now the father and the mother are in there together usually and the baby's born and there's rejoicing and everybody's called and grandparents travel across the world just to get to see the little shriveled up little child as it first comes out of the womb they're all, they're all beautiful. I mean, you know, when they're first born, they, sometimes they got cone heads and all kinds of stuff, but they're all beautiful, right? Because fathers rejoice in their children, don't they? They love their children. They treasure them. And if you're a mother or father and you have a child, how precious. You give your life for that child. You do everything for that child. You don't mind, you know, wiping dirty bums. I never mind it wiping a dirty bum. Grace is not here today, I can say that. <laughs> I never minded it. I loved my child, and I still do. And that's what Jesus says I'll be to you. I'll be a father to you. He, he's, he's produced many children. Look what it says in Romans 8, 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So by adoption, we become the children of God. It's a spiritual adoption. We become born again of the Spirit of God. 
The Spirit of God makes you a new creation on the inside and now you become a child of God and now you see God for who he really is, a wonderful, loving Father, and you understand that Jesus brought all this to pass by dying on the cross for your sins, by rising again, and by actively being the Father to you that you need. And the word Abba here means Papa, Daddy. It's not a cold word. It's not a harsh word. It's not a word, Father in heaven. It's Papa, Daddy. It's the kind of word that makes you want to crawl up in his lap and sit there and be comforted. I love my little granddaughter, Marika. And oh, does it ever do my heart good when she comes running to me and crawls up in my lap and then she kisses me and kisses me again. And, and then we're across the room and she goes, Huh. You know what that does to a grandpa? Oof, a grampy, that's my name, grampy, not grandpa. Grampy. Not grumpy. I just spent two or three days with her and Grace. We went on a little trip to see Heather's mom and 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 even oh look and she went to see Heather's mom and she I said, that's Grammy Beth. That's Beth, she says. But anyway, I could talk about her all day long. Why? Because I love her. And God loves you. And God wants to adopt you. He wants to take you out of the darkness, the Bible says, and bring you into the light. He wants to take a soul that's shriveled and broken and, and hurt and wounded and take you in and wrap his arms around you and transform your whole experience of life. When you're not a believer, it doesn't make any sense. It's all... You just think about it, some, oh, that's some kind of religion. It isn't religion, it's a relationship with the living God that he invites you to, to take you in. It's beautiful. Not only does he become a father to us, and this is all because he's risen from the dead. That's why the, it's so important to consider the resurrection, because if he died on the cross, and he just died and that was the end of him, well, there'd be nothing left for you, would there? I mean, so what? Some guy did it, but now he's gone. No, it's not gone. He is now a father to those. The Bible says he's a father to the fatherless. He's also called a captain. That means he's over you, but he's also protecting you. It was fitting for him of whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons or children to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Complete is the word through sufferings. It's not that Jesus wasn't perfect in his nature, but you see, he took on humanity. He became God, became a man, and welded himself to humanity. He became a brother. Look, it says in Hebrews 2.11, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified, he who makes you holy and those who are being made holy, are all of one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren or brothers. He considers himself your father, your captain, your brother, your friend. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down one's life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. He considers himself a friend. Isn't that something? God wants to be your friend. He wants to be your older brother. He wants to be your captain. And he wants to be your shepherd. Jesus said in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by, and I'm known by my own. As the Father loves me, even so I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. This is who the risen Savior is. This is his heart towards each one who comes to him. If you will come, he will be your captain. He will be your friend. He will be your older brother. He will be your shepherd. He will be your father. Oh, he's so full, full of mercy and grace. Yes, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he will see his seed. That is you. Then it says, he will prolong his days. Now, we just, if you went through Isaiah 53 with us, you saw that he was ripped and torn completely to pieces. There was nothing left by the time he was hanging on that cross. His body was just ripped from the head to the soles of his feet. Everything was ruined. How can someone prolong their days if this happens? 
And on top of that, the soldier came and thrust the sword in his side to make sure that he was dead. And blood and water came pouring out of him. There was nothing left. How can he prolong his days after that? How can he live on after that? This is what it means. He'll prolong his days. He'll keep on going. That's what it means. How can that happen? Well, the Bible tells us this. He has come not according to the law of a fleshly command, but according to the power of an endless life. Because he rose from the dead. Because death couldn't hold him. Because as Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, and he spoke about how he would not let my soul, let, let me, my body have corruption. That he, he spoke of David's prophecies. And he made it clear that God raised his son from the dead. That's why he can still have many children. That's why he's still having many children today. All over the world, there are people right now who are trusting in Christ as their Savior. They're being born again in the Spirit of God. They're entering into a love relationship with God. Their sins are all forgiven, and they have a home in heaven waiting for them because of the mercy of God, because of a Heavenly Father who wants to bring us home. And there are many verses that speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just not one or two, but many. There's hundreds of them or more that speak about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, validated every which way possible, that this is a risen Savior, an ascended Savior, and a Savior who can be the Father that He's meant to be. You know, some fathers, they have children and then they're gone. They abandon their children. They abandon them. Mothers abandoning their children. I tell you this, God doesn't abandon his children. God has not abandoned even the human race in all of its rebellion. He should have abandoned us all. He should have left us to our own devices. And I can tell you this, if you think that it's the wisdom of presidents and uh, um, rulers in other countries that have kept us from blowing ourselves to pieces through a nuclear war, it is the mercy of God that has kept us from blowing ourselves to pieces. The human race has always used, to its fullest extent, every weapon that they've ever developed, except for nuclear. And if they did, we'd all be blasted to pieces a thousand times over. It's a useless thing. More and more, they're still making more nuclear weapons, and yet they've already reached the threshold that nothing alive would be left on Earth if the bombs ever went off. And now the panic is on because there's all these other countries who are rogue nations, and we got guys on there who couldn't care less if they blew the whole human race up, and they're trying to get their nuclear hands on nuclear weapons to be able to shoot them off in this direction and that direction. Do you think it's the wisdom of humanity that has kept us alive? No, it's the grace of God. Because the Bible tells us the way the world will end. And it tells us that these certain things have to happen before we get there. And they're not going to happen until then. God, the Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit restraining the world. Restraining until the day comes when he moves his, he moves his, he removes his restraints. And he's going to say, okay, human race, I've restrained you long enough. Go your way. Go as wicked as you want to go. In the meantime, I'm going to save. I'm going to keep on saving sinners until the last day. But it'll come. Friends, don't put your hope in the world. Don't put your hope in politics. Don't you think the next government's going to be better than the last one? It doesn't matter in the end. Now, I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not saying don't be involved and do the best you can to keep things as, be as best as we can and have righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a curse to any people. But nevertheless, it is the rulership of God that we need. It is the transformed heart that's going to bring the difference. And we know that he has come with the power of an endless life and he has risen from the dead. He lives and he reigns. And it says the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. What does that mean? It means that the Lord is in control. God's in control. You're not. It means God can do what he wants. And you might say, well, God, I don't like what you're doing there, so I'm not going to have anything to do with you. Go ahead. Is he going to say, God going to say, oh, well, gee, I better get off the throne. You come on up here and take over for a while. You think that's going to happen? He's God. He made everything. He made everything that moves. He can do what he wants. The pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his own hand. You can't dictate God. You can't say, well, I'm going to run the show. I think there was a show Jim Carrey did. What was it called? Something about, I forget. He, 
he was pretending, he, th he thought, what was it? Almighty. Yeah, Bruce Almighty or something like that. Yeah, he decided he, was, he would get a chance of being God. So he, he, the moon was too far away. I, I, I faintly remember seeing the moon was, I, I want the moon closer. Pull, pull the moon in closer because he was now he was God, right? So he pulls the moon in right close. And what happens? Floods and tides and earthquakes and the incredible damage. He didn't have a clue what he was doing. Neither do you. We don't have a clue. We need God to be God. Let him be God. And if he is God, and if he really is the ruler of the world, and if he really has made everything, and he has made you, surely he knows what's best for you better than you know yourself. You know, we're not as grown up as we think we are. If my little granddaughter Marika says to me, uh, Grampy, Grampy, I'm going to go play on the yellow line. Am I going to say, go ahead, Marika, that sounds like fun. Lay down on it. Would I do that? No. What would I do? No way. You're not going there. You're coming with me over here. Oh, Grampy, please. No, it's not going to happen. Let God be God. You go play on the yellow line. What do you think is going to happen? Eventually, you're going to get run over, right? And we think we're so grown up, and we think we know so much. God's good pleasure is to save sinners, is to put his love on you, and to take you down good paths, right paths. And we think we know better. All authority, Jesus said, is given to me in heaven and on earth. He's in control. It says he shall, Isaiah 53, 11, he will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Satisfied. Imagine. What's he satisfied with? It was worth it, he says. It was worth the crucifixion. It was worth the crown of thorns. It was worth the lashings across my back. It was worth the nails thrust in my hands. It was worth all of the suffering. It was worth being forsaken by the Father and crying out in agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was worth it. Why? Because he took on humanity for eternity. You see, Jesus didn't just come here and be a man for 33 years and then go back to being God. Done. Ah, that's in the past. Now let's see if I can find some new project. It's not what he did. What he did is he came and he took on humanity for eternity. Because it tells us in 1 Timothy 2.5, there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. This is the one we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. He is God-man in heaven now. Jesus loved the human race enough to take on humanity for eternity, to say, well, now I'm your older brother, but I really am because I am now a man and God at the same time. God and man welded together forever. It's so important to understand that. This is the one, the man Christ Jesus. You see, it is not resumption, but resurrection. And what I mean by that, he did not resume as before in heaven. Before he came to earth, when he was conceived within the womb of Mary, he, he owned everything. The Bible says he made everything. He, I mean, how much more can you own if you own everything? How much more can you do if you've done everything? However, when he came to earth, when he humbled himself, when he went to the cross, and then when he rose from the dead, he took a human body into heaven, and he remains a human being and God for eternity future. Do you grasp that? He was well pleased. He considered it worth it to join himself to the human race forever. That's amazing, isn't it? So it's not resumption. It's not going back to what he was when he was in heaven before. That's why the resurrection is so powerful. That's why when he says all authority is given to me in heaven and earth, now it's all authority given to me who is a man and God. I have all authority. So he did not resume as he was before in heaven, and he did not resume as, as before on earth either. When he was on earth, he was God and he was man. But he was living in the fallen bodies that we have. That's not so anymore, any longer. Fully resurrected, full authority, full power. He has changed everything. Everything changed. Why? Because now, now, I, I got a friend in high places. Now, I have an older brother who's looking out for me. 
now I have a relationship with him that's not just external. It's not like, oh yeah, God's up there and I'm down here. No, it's internal because he said, when I go back to heaven, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to live in you. So now it's internal and now it's a union created between not only the human race and Jesus and the person of God and humanity together in one in Jesus, but also because of who he is now and through the work of the Holy Spirit, you come into a union with God, an incredible union, so much so that God says, Jesus said, Father, me in you and you in me and I in them and them in me. He says, I'm, I'm inviting them into the inner circle. Now, it's not that you become God. Don't get, you know, little hide. But understand the value of what Jesus has done in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection. He's created a union with us, and he has declared it a permanent union. Thank God for that one. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That is incredible. And that is his promise. I didn't make that up. He says, he says that you're in my hand, you're in the Father's hand, and you will never perish. Actually, it says you'll not never perish, which you can't say in English, but you can in Greek, which is a double negative, which gives twice the emphasis, you cannot be lost once you are his shepherd, once you are his sheep, because the good shepherd doesn't lose his sheep. So then my hope, my hope of life now with God, my hope of eternal life is all wrapped up in the promises of God and not in my effort to keep myself. Praise God. No wonder it says in Isaiah 53, 11, he will see the labor of his soul and he will be satisfied. He'll be satisfied with this. He's satisfied to save you. He's satisfied with what he did on the cross. The labor of his soul was an intense, deep labor, but it brings forth fruit and he's satisfied with it. It's like a mama when she's having the baby. Oh, I don't know about some of you mamas, but some mamas have had a hard time having babies. Some of them, they drop right out, like, poop, it's gone out. But for others, it's like agony. But when, as soon as that baby is in her arms, you forget all that. I think, I, I, I'm, Jesus said that. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't experienced that, okay. <laughs> but Jesus said, when, a, when a, a woman brings a child into the world and, and the labor is, is painful, but once she holds that child, it's all forgotten now. It's worth it. You, I don't think you find a mother who truly has any compassion and love and holding a baby in her arms say, oh, that wasn't worth it. Send it back. Give me another one. No chance, right? That's not the way it works. And Jesus looks at the labor of his soul which is you, and he looks at your souls, and he looks at your, your life, and you might think, well, I'm not very much worth it. God didn't get much when he got me. But he looks at you and he says, yes, I love you, and you're worth my dying for. You're worth it. You're worth my suffering. You're worth my pain. You're worth all of the agony, and I'd do it all again. And I think he would if it needed to be. Praise God, it doesn't. It's already done. It's completed. And so it says, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. <clears throat> by, my, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. It says here, in this passage, it says, not only in his death, but by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. The Bible says we are justified through the resurrection of Christ as well as his death because he's borne our sins and he stands before God on our behalf, he's satisfied with you. Praise God. He is so satisfied. Hebrews 12, 12. Let's go ahead to Hebrews 12, 12. It says this. We, are, we should be looking to Jesus. He is the author and he's the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame. It wasn't that he liked it. He didn't say, oh, yippee, I'm going to the cross. We know he wasn't because he was on his face crying to the Father, is there some other way? And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, but he did it for the joy that was set before him. And that joy is you. 
That joy is your salvation. That joy is seeing you brought from darkness to light. That joy is seeing you being rescued from hell. That joy is taking you and, and, and adopting you and holding you and growing you and forgiving you and picking you up when you fall on your face and you do all kinds of messes because we're a messy lot, aren't we? And yet the patience that he has, you know, parents got to have a lot of patience with their kids, don't they? You know, before I went on this little trip with Grace and Marika, Marika was a perfect baby. <laughs> but I've seen some other sides to that little girl. Man, she got a temper. And when she says no, she means no. But does it, does it cause me to love her less? Absolutely not. And God knows what he gets when he gets someone like you. He knows your messes. He knows your heart. He knows your foolishness. He knows your wayward heart. He knows how many times you're going to wander off from him. He knows how many times you're going to fail him and fail him badly. But he doesn't say, ah, not worth it. No, he says, you're worth it. You're worth it. You're not worth it because of your performance. If you were, you wouldn't get in. Okay? You're worth it because he just loves you. He puts his love on you and he adopts you. When we adopted our little girl, Grace, many years ago, we adopted her. She became our child. And that was it. And nobody's going to mess with my child because she's mine. Was she a perfect little girl? No. <laughs> She'll agree with that. Do, did, did my, has my love gone less over the years? No. God's perfect love is for everyone. And he offers it to you through his son. He offers adoption to you to become a child of God. Don't hesitate. But come running to the Savior. Receive him in your life. Accept him. Because he's willing to accept you. And you know what? Not everybody's willing to accept you. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> Lots of people will not accept you. But Jesus will. So, take the offer while it stands. And look to a risen Savior who's able to do all this and more for each one of us. Amen. Thank you for your word today, Lord. Thank you for the truth of it. And I pray, O oh God, that each of us will fall in love with you because you're in love with us and turn our lives over to a God who's trustworthy and see you do the transforming that needs to be done in our hearts. It can only be done by you. And Lord, many of us have preconceived notions of who you are, sometimes warped ideas. and Take away, Lord, all the lies. Take away all the, the things that aren't true and help us to see you as you are and see ourselves and see what you offer to us, O oh God. And may we come running to you. And Lord, if we're a Christian and we've gone astray, thank you that you're like that father, Lord, who comes after the prodigal son and comes running down the road when he comes back and puts his arm around and hugs and kisses and restores. And Oh, you're such an awesome God. And I thank you for it, Lord. I thank you for how awesome you are. That you would save someone like me, Lord. Someone who walked away from you and had nothing to do with you and lived a life of, a horrible life. But you loved me. And you love anyone. Anyone can come. So pour out your blessing, Lord, on all of us and those who are watching or those who are listening on TV, radio, whatever, on whatever it is, Lord. We just pray that your blessing will fall and eyes will be opened and that people will find a real answer and real hope in life. Thank you again for the privilege of being here. We pray you'll bless our food and fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen.